Hello, thank you for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. I am David Pendergrass. I've been wanting to record this podcast for quite some time, and I'm not sure why I haven't done it, but I wanted to talk today a little about the concept of wisdom. When I think about wisdom in this day and age, I, I'm not an old, old man, but I can notice uh, people who are younger, like myself, I guess, we don't talk about wisdom ever. You don't hear it much in amongst pundits, amongst even scholarship, certainly not in the news. You just don't hear it often. But where you hear it very, very often is in the Bible. The concept is throughout. It is pervasive. It is replete in the Old New Testament and all through Jewish literature. The ancient Greeks and the Romans talked about wisdom often. It's something that's just not very popular in American culture at all. When you look up the definition of wisdom, just in standard dictionaries today, uh, for example, uh, the first part here in uh, Wikipedia, which you can look up, the same thing if you look at dictionary, just Google it, it's the quality uh, of having experience, knowledge, and good judgment. Or Wikipedia says, wisdom is the ability to think and act using knowledge, experience, understanding, common sense, and insight. So they say wisdom is the ability to think and act using knowledge. And biblically speaking, sometimes it's used that way, but in general, that's not how it's understood. And there's a, I need to unpack several different points uh, in this podcast. I hope you'll stay with me because I think it's going to be worth your time. Uh, Not because I'm saying it, but because it's biblical. (laughs) It's from the Christian worldview. In the Christian worldview, there is a key distinction between knowledge and wisdom. Now, wisdom is a kind of knowledge. Not all knowledge is wisdom, uh, but wisdom is a kind of knowledge. Wisdom is a kind of directed knowledge. In the Bible, it's hard to define this in one way. But in general, it's safe to say that in general, rule of thumb is when you see the word wise or wisdom in the Old and New Testament, it means something along the lines of ordering life the way God wants. So wisdom is a kind of knowledge that lets us know how God wants to order things. In American English, we have an expression, yeah, now the world is all right, or all the world is right again. Maybe things are discombobulated. Maybe you feel stressed or out of place. And when things get in place, you go, okay, you kind of dig a deep breath. <sighs> okay, now the world is back to right. All's, it's kind of all in place again. And a lot of times you'll hear parents say this, maybe if the kids have come home from Thanksgiving or Christmas break, they're sitting around a fireplace and all the world is right. It's like the world is ordered just correctly. Well, the ancient Jews thought that way all the time. In fact, ancient people thought that all the time. Uh, Jews, um, Egyptians, Mediterranean cultures, they believed that the gods were in control of the order of the cosmos. They would say the world. We would say maybe the universe. But it was the gods' uh, responsibility. And the gods, uh, most ancient cultures in the Mediterranean world at least, believe that the gods worked with humans to make sure order is established. Now, in Judaism, there's some similarities, but some key differences. And that, of course, is, uh, well, there's a lot of them. But uh, John Walton, as an Old Testament specialist, talks a lot about this in his works. And it's he's worth your time, that's for sure, to read. Uh, but I want to talk about, not, I'm not going to go into all that right now, because this could be a multi-part series on wisdom. My only part right now is, uh, is that wisdom has to do with order in the universe. Things ought to be right. And they're right according to what God wants. So that's what it means in Judaism. Not right what Allah wants in you know Islam or maybe a Hindu God or maybe certainly not a naturalism and atheism. But wisdom is how to order life correctly. It's the knowledge of how to do life well according to what God wants. And this is a very basic and pervasive idea of all through Jewish literature. I mean, there it's an enormous amount of literature written. There are entire documents written just for this concept. I mean, the wisdom of Solomon. Of course, the, the, the one that comes to mind immediately, the, mo- the oldest one, is the book of Proverbs. Proverbs, most scholars think Proverbs is a collection of wisdom sayings, anecdotes passed down from through families, but particularly seems to be used for someone who is elite, wealthy, and or educated, all the above, and perhaps even a prince or royalty, someone's preparing to be king. Uh, it's, it's, it's uncertain if these kind of wisdom sayings would have been passed on for the, quote, average person. But it probably is the case that Proverbs was originally uh, accumulated and written down, uh, put together, so that it would prepare people for office. But then that's important because a person needs to know how to order their life correctly and certainly needs to know how to order their judicial uh, declarations correctly. They need to make sure they're making uh, proper judgments. And that's very important. Uh, Ancient Jews thought that the ultimate source of wisdom was God. God is the source of all wisdom. So if you want to know how you're supposed to order your life well, you go to God. 
And you can learn knowledge about plants and how where babies come from and crops and harvesting and so forth, but that's not the same as wisdom. Wisdom is the kind of knowledge that God gives to you that lets you know how you're supposed to live life well. Now, Jews, when you read the book of Proverbs and other documents, it seems to be the case that wisdom can come from various sources. It can come from moms and dads and grandparents and royalty and judges and so forth. But ultimately, wisdom comes from God. It's a, it's a gift of God that lets us know how we're supposed to live life. And we see this throughout the documents so pervasively, it lets us know that the Jews took it so seriously. It really is a bedrock understanding of what we now call ethics. Ethics, ancient Jewish ethics were predicated upon wisdom or being uh, the opposite of of a wise person uh, is, of course, in the Old Testament, is a fool, a foolishness, foolishness, the opposite of wisdom. We see this throughout all the Old Testament. For example, even in Genesis, it very well could have been the case, um, and some scholars uh, like John Walton and others make the case for this, I think they're correct, that when Adam and Eve were told not to eat from the tree, uh, knowledge of good and evil, they didn't hear this as, I don't know what good things are until I eat this tree, but rather, it's a tree of wisdom. That is to say, that is to say what's bad about their decision is that they're seeking ways to order their life apart from God. They're seeking wisdom apart from God. And not only does that fit the expression good and evil, which we see throughout Jewish literature, if it's precisely a massive theme throughout the entire Old Testament literature and even through the New Testament, and that is Jews believe that the ultimate source of wisdom was God. And when you seek wisdom outside of God, you're a fool. Uh, most preachers preach, you know, uh, they'll say the Psalm 1, the, the fool said in, says in his heart, there is no God. They'll say, this is the, uh, you know, all about atheism. Well, no, it's not. I mean, virtually no Old Testament scholar thinks that. Instead, because atheists really didn't exist in the time period that was written. Instead, what it means is they act as if there is no God, which means they're foolish. They're foolish. And their heart means they make up their mind. There's no God that is the Yahweh God doesn't exist. These other gods exist. I'll behave like I want to behave like these other gods. And that's foolishness. We see this all the way, again, if we have the, I do have the time, but I won't spend the time going through every single verse. It, it is, I guess, Judge, I trust me, it's all over the place. So a couple of things right off the bat to repeat myself. One is that uh, wisdom is a kind of knowledge, but it's not the, it is not the same thing as knowledge. Uh, secondly, is wisdom is about how to order life well. And third, wisdom comes ultimately from God. We see this throughout everywhere. There are books like the, and we have whole chapters in Proverbs uh, that speak about wisdom coming from God and wisdom wooing a person and wanting to go throughout a person's, uh, it's personified. Wisdom becomes personified. Wisdom speaks to people, woos people, infuses people as relationship. Of course, you read Proverbs 8, which is the most controversial chapter in all the early church, uh, the patristic era. He says, before creation, I created you. He means wisdom. That was controversial in our early church, by the way, because they equated the word of God, uh, the logos, Jesus incarnate. Uh, so, I mean, before he was incarnate, that they equated him with wisdom. And that became controversial because it sounds like it sounds like the son of God was created. But in Old Testament scholarship, and no, and no one thinks that in scholarship, but no one thought of ancient Judaism. No one thought that he's talking about the word of God or Jesus before he became Jesus. What they're talking about is just wisdom. Uh, it's a way of talking about wisdom is with God. And they did personify wisdom as this distinct thing. But it it comes from God, the Father, but it's, it's it takes a life of its own. And now how much the earliest primitive Jews really thought that wisdom was of its own is unclear. But it does become clear that Jews did start speaking about wisdom as something personified. And that wisdom then communicates to people. It's kind of a way of having a separation between God the Father and other creatures. Wisdom speaks. Wisdom, I'd use a Latin term, inspires. Wisdom goes through. And so what happens in Judaism, certainly by the time you get to the, in between the Old New Testament and then by the New Testament era, as Jewish documents continue to be written, wisdom is manifested in a few key ways. And Jews seem to stay on these trajectories. They kind of pick one or mix them together. One major argument is that wisdom was revealed to people through the prophets. And they would call this the word of the Lord, word of God, God's word. It's spoken through prophets. And so you get wisdom on how to order life because prophets tell you. Another major way that's related is the word, the word of, as the wisdom comes through the word of God through the spirit, the Holy Spirit. And this becomes very dominant 
and various Jewish groups, and we see this all through the Gospels, like in John's Gospel. In John's Gospel, the wisdom of God is is almost synonymous with the Holy Spirit or Spirit, and so we see the role of wisdom. There's a lot of literature and scholarship on this topic. Uh, we also see wisdom manifested in the work of the law, and so if we have books like the book of Psalms uh, that cry out and praise to God, he's given wisdom through the law. We see this all the way through other intertestamental books, and we see it in the New Testament and Gospel of Matthew. Matthew likes to equate uh, the wisdom coming through the law, the Torah, and of course, it's the law, particularly as Jesus interprets it. Uh, so we see it in different ways, and then we have things like in the Qumran community, and I, I won't go into that right now because this is not a podcast on every single way it's used in Judaism. I'm, I'm you know, I'm heading somewhere with all this. Uh, so we see in the Gospels that uh, we, particularly in Matthew and John, that wisdom itself is used a lot. <clears throat> Mark and Luke don't use wisdom themes much at all. They don't. Uh, they're just it. There are pieces of it here and there. But it's been known for a long time, if you just read it carefully, Matthew and John rely heavily upon uh, wisdom motifs, particularly the Gospel of John. Of course, the beginning of the Gospel of John, in, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh. Now, let's talk a little about that concept of Word, and I've done other podcasts, so I won't spend much time on this issue. Uh, but the idea of wisdom uh, from the Hebrew and the course of the Greek, it became equated with the Word of God, God's Word, the Logos. And of course, the Greek word Sophia and the Logos is the, the Greek word. They became uh, basically synonymous in large part. And this is where it gets really confusing because the Greeks and the Romans also had a concept of the Logos or the Word. And they had similar concepts. This Logos was a primal cosmic uh, fact of existence. And this Logos, this Word, permeated everything and gave order to the universe and, and is the source of all reason. The earliest Jews, in the well, the first century Jews, by the time they get influenced by Hellenism, and it seems to be the case, they were influenced, they start saying, yeah, that's exactly right, that we've been saying that all along, that's the wisdom of God. God is that word. God's word is the same thing. God's wisdom, God's word are synonymous. And the earliest Jews who were Christians, some of them picked up on the same idea, um, like as we see manifest in the Gospel of John. Another Jewish author who's not Christian who picks up on the same idea is, the, is Philo, who of course lived in Egypt around the same time period. He did a lot of speculation like this. So we see wisdom that shows up in the Gospels in Matthew and in John, and it'd be an interesting study sometime if I were you to look to see how these uh, wisdom is used. But what I want to do is just very briefly, John's Gospel has been talked about so much, and I've talked about another podcast. I don't want to spend too much energy there, but I'll say briefly in John's gospel, Jesus basically is walking wisdom. He's just walking with, he's, as he says, the prologue, he's tabernacle among us. And so we see that God's wisdom is just everywhere. I mean, you could go on and on. In Matthew's text, um, Jesus is personified of wisdom, but not as much, but he is there, but he's a little more the messenger uh, of uh, God's wisdom. Anyway, I, I thought this um, this passage here stood out to me. I, I thought about this immediately when I was thinking about the Wisdom podcast. If you know Matthew chapter 11, in Matthew 11, Jesus is a kind of a hodgepodge, a grouping of teachings, a collection of teachings. Matthew's put together, and he speaks of Jesus saying uh, that Jesus is called, a, he's a glutton and a sinner, and then he's... In verse 20 and following, verse 20, 24, he gives judgment woes like prophets gave. A woe means like, whoa, Nelly, that's a bad deal. There's judgment coming. When we get to verse 25, um, we have Jesus's basic invitation to take his instruction or his wisdom uh, upon yourself. So he wants disciples. If you're a disciple, you're someone who takes upon Jesus's instruction or his wisdom. And so Matthew has joined these two things together. Now, these two different teachings. We don't know if Jesus originally said these together or not. There's no way to know. But Matthew's put these together. Matthew eleven 25, I'll read from the NET translation. He says, at that time, and he, I won't, I'll, sorry, I want to unpack every single phrase, but I won't because of time. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, or I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, common expression, because you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and reveal them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your gracious will. Now, pause here for a second. It was commonplace, if you read Proverbs and the wisdom of Solomon particularly, but in other Jewish literature, it was common to believe that God revealed his wisdom to wise people and to intelligent people. It seems to have been the case that the idea is that if, if a person, because this is all through the Proverbs, if you sought God's wisdom, he was going to give it. 
and he wanted to give it to you. So if you were already wise, it's more likely he's going to keep giving you wisdom because it means you're seeking God. But also seems to be the assumption in some texts that a wise could handle it. They could handle it well. It's kind of like if I gave you some Kool-Aid or Gatorade and you could handle that, I'll give you a little more, I'll give you a little more. Here Jesus says something that's, I don't know if it's unique, but it is quite distinct. It's idiosyncratic in Jewish wisdom literature. People didn't talk this way. Jews did not praise God for giving wisdom to non, uh, I'll say unwise, non-wise people. He didn't do that. Jesus says, in this case, it is the case that what has happened is God the Father has chosen to reveal what God wants in the world to people who do not have a long tradition and history of being the wise or intelligent. In fact, he says, verse 26, in fact, this is your will. This is what you want now. Verse 27, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. Now, he probably means there all things that I do in my ministry. That is to say, my authority to teach encompasses everything. So whatever I teach you about what God is doing, what God wants in the kingdom of God, God's reign, God's rule, it's by my Father. And this is very bizarre in, in the gospel synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Because Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus doesn't speak this way ever, ever, ever. And John, he does all over the place. In John's gospel, I and the Father are one. We're all in this together. It's, I mean, it's, it's amazing. Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not present Jesus that way. But Matthew 11, he does. And this is a very, it just really stands out. It sounds very Johannine. So all things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son decides to reveal him. Now, this is amazing, exclusive language that Jesus is saying, somewhat hyperbolic, I'm sure, but the point is, you don't know the Father and what the Father wants. You can't get wisdom from God the Father unless you get that wisdom from me. And that's why it leads to verses 28, 29, and 30, which is, Come to me, all of you who are becoming weary and exhausted or burdened, and I will refresh you. I will give you rest. Take my yoke on you and learn from me. My yoke. Now, the, the yoke, of course, is that wooden bar that joins two animals, like horses, oxes, whatever, together, and they pull things behind it. Here, of course, it's, it's a figurative or metaphorical use, and it means the instruction that a teacher gives a disciple. And we see this through other rabbinic texts, that a yoke became a metaphor for that. It's something we bind together. It doesn't have to be heavy. I mean, literally, a yoke is heavy on an animal. But the point is, it binds you together with another animal. And it becomes a metaphor with when a disciple or a student, uh, and listen to my podcast on disciple. I did it not long ago. Listen to my podcast on being a disciple. Uh, when you become a disciple of Jesus, the idea is that you get bound together. You're hooked up together with Jesus in his instruction, his lifestyle, and his values. But Jesus is, of course, take my yoke upon you, get bound by me, with me, and learn from me. That means the same thing. Take my yoke and learn from me are synonymous, mean the exact same thing. Learn from me. Because why? I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, my load is not hairy to carry. My yoke is easy, my, bo- my load is light. So if you look, take my instruction or my wisdom and not the wisdom of the people, uh, then it's light and easy. And that's in counter distinction to other Jewish teachers of the time. And Jesus, of course, here is saying one more time, he's doing something quite distinct, which Jesus often did things quite distinct. He's saying, I'm so glad the Father has chosen in this instance to make sure what he wants, his uh, what he, he calls him these things, uh, it seems to be his instruction about the kingdom of God. He's not revealed them to the typical religious elite. In fact, he's chosen to reveal, uh, to reveal it to anyone who comes to Jesus through the Son. And that's what we find throughout the gospel, certainly in Matthew's gospel. Jesus teaches not to the elite in general, but to the non-elite, uh, to people who are fishermen, and people who had demon possess, possession, and people who were tax collectors, and on and on. So that's how wisdom works, and that's we see that in life right now. Uh, in the Christian worldview, God is not revealing himself and giving wisdom just to people who are highly educated and just to people who are already very informed. The Christian movement has always, in fact, has always uh, spread like wildfire amongst common masses, common folk like me. Common folk, not royalty passed down from kings and queens downward, which everybody thought would happen, uh, or passed on from the highly educated and taught only in schools, which ancient Jews thought would happen. 
But Jesus and the early church spread like wildfire because they didn't do that. It spread because they talked to anybody. And as far as we can tell in the ancient uh, Roman context of the first century, that's not how early assemblies occurred. Assembly, the Greek word ekklesia, is often t- translated through the German for church. Ekklesia just means a free assembly. Free assemblies, you could have free assemblies of poor people gathered together. But what you didn't have in the Roman time period, as far as I know at all in any research I've done, you wouldn't. Have, you did not have free associations, assemblies, of, mult, of different social statuses put in the same group. You didn't have that. In Christianity, you did. And that was very bizarre to have slaves next to free people, next to royalty, next to whomever. And it spread. To this day, of course, it still spreads that way. So the wisdom of Jesus is what spreads. And and I want that, again, we can go through a lot of verses about the idea that God's instruction or, and Jesus' instruction is wisdom. Uh, but at, here I just want to pause for a second and say that is precisely what, that's what's true in a Christian worldview. In the Christian worldview, God wants to give people his wisdom. Well, let me say it this way. Let me say it this way. God wants you and me to order our lives the way he wants. That's what God wants. That's just what he wants. And and he wants it. Moreover, he has the capacity to, he, he has it, he has the wisdom, and he has the capacity to make sure we know enough of it to do it well. That's very important to understand. L- life, I, I've known very knowledgeable people who are not wise at all. I've known very wise people who are not very knowledgeable. Did I say that correctly? People who are, yeah, very educated, but not wise. They were unwise. And people who are very wise and very people who are uneducated. And and in my experience, even in the church, people get that very confused. They typically think that people know a lot of Bible facts, they're wise. And that's not true. Though, of course, having Bible facts, if you instantiate it, if it really gets inside of you, of course, then you ideally start living a more um, ordered life the way God wants it. But you can know something and not live by it. Thanks for listening so far. I'll be right back. It can be difficult as a Christian to know what to do with our money. And there are all kinds of good books out there to read, but I encourage you, if you want something short and sweet and to the point, check out my book, Give It Away, on Amazon.com. It's very cheap. Go there today to get Give It Away, and it's a wonderful study to use in small groups. It has discussion questions and reflection questions ready to go. It's a four-week study on how the earliest Christians used money and their possessions. Hey, not everybody can be a biblical scholar or an apologist. And I understand that. Everyone understands it. So we have to use good resources to help us save us a lot of time and give us things to think about and maybe some data, a good starting point. If I might be so bold, I would encourage you to read my book, A Skeptic Challenges a Christian. A Skeptic Challenges a Christian on Amazon.com. You can check it out today. It's not expensive. So far, praise God, the reviews have been great. You can use it for small group study, Bible studies, whatever you want. And I think it's going to help encourage you and equip you, perhaps even a skeptic you know. Maybe you can purchase the book for them. It's in multiple formats. You can listen to the book, Kindle, paperback, whatever it might be. I think it'll bless you. It would help me a whole lot. If you like these podcasts, let people know about it. Just share the link. Just share the link. What would Jesus do? He would share the link. That's what I think. I think he would do that. (laughs) Let people know about a glimpse of the kingdom today. Would you like Dr. Pendergrass to come visit your church? He could speak and provide classes and training on multiple topics. Visit davidpendergrass.com for more information. Okay, let's pick back up where I left off. The other day, uh, by analogy, just the other day I was talking to my daughter who was really upset at me and life and whatever and she's she's 13 and all that entails and she was upset with me and, and talking about stuff we had a, we, we talk a lot in our family a lot of communication and she was telling me stuff she didn't like about me things that I didn't do well or whatever we had a good talk and uh, we uh, several things but one of the things we talked about was uh, her dislike of certain choices I made about things she could and couldn't do and I made the point, as I've said throughout their lives, but I made it very, very clearly uh, in this point, something that reminds me very much of the Christian worldview. And I told her, I said, honey, I mean, several things. I won't repeat the whole conversation just really because of time. Uh, but one thing that I said was, you're a child. You are very unwise. 
Yeah, yes, yes, I did tell her that just like that. I said, you don't know anything about wisdom. You, you, don't, you and your brother don't know anything about wisdom because you're kids. Children don't have wisdom. We, we don't consult children before we make decisions in life because you're a child. I mean, that's, it was true for me when I was a child. It's true for ideally any ch- children. That's just why a little footnote. I mean, people argue about having, you know, 14 year old, 15 year old, 16 year old kids vote. I mean, okay. Anyway, that's just a dump. Um, it, it, and, and it doesn't mean, it doesn't necessarily mean someone's wiser just because they're older. Of course not, but it is more likely uh, that even basic wisdom issues, but in the Christian worldview, of course, uh, children are not wise. We do the basic. I mean, pagans, I would think would argue with that. I mean, would agree with that. <laughs> they would argue with it too. And I told her, honey, I told my daughter, I am much, much more wise than you are. So is your mom. And because we have more wisdom, it, we're, we have it. We have it to give. Two, we give it. And three, it means that we're always going to trust our wisdom over yours. I mean, always. And so, for example, then, then I gave her several examples of the things she didn't like that I was doing. I, I went by a checklist of this, 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 and I gave her the reasons behind it. Now, some of those things I've already told her before many, many times, but she didn't want to hear it at the time. Uh, but at the time, she, the other day when I had this conversation, she seemed to really listen to it. I mean, I gave her reasons, rational, good reasons. And then she started, you know, kind of giggling and smiling like, oh, yeah, that does make sense of all these things. And I said, that's my point. So if I went by what you just said and you didn't do X, Y, da, 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 da real danger could occur. Uh, I mean, something as simple as brushing your teeth. If you don't brush your teeth, your teeth getting infected, that can, that can, I mean, it takes a while, but the bacteria can lead to your heart, it can kill you. Bad t- dental hygiene kills people around the globe. And my daughter's not one day away from that. Uh, of course not, but it can lead to that. Uh, so, and I've told her many, you know, several times in my life. So I told my son many times as the parent, I have the capacity to deal with the emotional state in, in myself for you to be mad at me. I, I can live with that. I don't like it. I don't enjoy it. But I have the capacity to process those feelings. Uh, one is because I just have good boundaries. But the second reason why I can process it is because I know that I'm more wise than you are. I know that. What I mean is I know that the outcome of my wisdom is better for you than yours. So it, it that's it. I mean, that's I know I can. I, I know it. So I rest. I sleep well at night. If she's very mad at me because she didn't want to do blank, or I don't understand why I can't do this, but I know for a fact my decision is more wise than hers, I'm perfectly okay with that. Again, I don't like people to be upset at me. I don't like it. That doesn't make me happy. I'm not a sadist. And I said that to her too, you know, we laughed, but I said, at the same time, as your parent, I love you so much that I will always give you the wise option as best as I understand it. Well, it's like that with God, just infinitely more. God has the wisdom to give us. He has the capacity and has always had the capacity to share it with us, enough wisdom for us to do life the way he wants. And he simply is in the office of person who is the only source uh, to which people must turn. And and what happens, no matter how old we are, or the children, adult, whatever, there's always someone, quote, above us uh, who is more wise. One of the problems with adults, uh, one of the problems with children is they think they know everything. They think that they're, they both have infinite knowledge and infinite wisdom. Part of the problem with adults is that they think they know everything. And what happens is if we get more wisdom over time, it can give us the, if I were British, the charade, the charade, the, the false sense of security that I have enough wisdom to do life on my own. And then, of course, that's just, I mean, that's nonsense. It's just nonsense. Wise adults always know how much they need to seek more wisdom. It doesn't mean you're always ignorant and you never have wisdom. No, 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 no. You can have wisdom and Christians. Christians ought to be wise people. They should be. But wise people know they don't know everything. Wise people know they can have more wisdom. Wise people know they ought to reach out to other people and seek their wisdom whenever necessary. And then, of course, make your own, you know, eventually just make a decision. But it's like that with God. He wants you and me to make wise choices. Now, so far, most people who, if you're listening to this podcast, most Christians go, yeah, David, I get it. So what? I mean, of course they do. But if we're just being gut level honest, gut level honest, most people don't treat God that way. Most people don't treat Christianity that way. Most people do not treat Jesus that way. The fact is, most people 
do not treat Jesus as if he was and is wise. They don't. Most people, most Christians, people who say they believe in Jesus, he died for my sins, and on and on and on. Most people do not treat Jesus as if he has wisdom to give us. And the reason why I know that is because most Christians I meet have no clue what Jesus actually taught. They don't have a clue. When people want to know about how to live life, they Google it. When people want to know how to make decisions that are wise, they send in letters to newspaper editors. They find people, the other day I was watching something on TV and I had this person who for years and years written for a newspaper that I haven't read, I don't know, New York Times or some big newspaper. And he's just a dude who did whatever, I can't remember what his background was, was nothing related whatsoever. It's not a philosopher, not an ethicist, not a theologian. I mean, none of that stuff. He's just, I think, a gay guy with a partner in life and whatever. And he's all, for years and years and years, all of his, his wisdom of how to live life. And... It doesn't mean he's necessarily wrong. I heard some of the things he talked about. I remember thinking that I wouldn't say that way at all. But people, my point is, and he gets, of course, him, people like, was it Dear Abby and all this stuff? Thousands and thousands and thousands of letters every year. This happens all over the place. People are seeking wisdom all the time. They're starving for it. You and I do that. We're all seeking wisdom. How do I live life now this pandemic is out? What do I do with my children? How do I raise my kids? <clears throat> How do I tell my kids about what movies they can and cannot watch? What do I do when my children talk about sex? What do I do when my daughter thinks she's bisexual? What if my son's a transgender? What about, what about, what about, what about? We're all seeking wisdom. And the first place we go, almost always, first, second, third, fourth place we go, has nothing to do with the Bible. We don't seek wisdom from Jesus. We don't seek wisdom from biblical text. Now, why is that? Well, you get to tell. I mean, I, <laughs> if you fit that category, I mean, you know, I don't know why you don't do it. I would surmise some people don't do it because they just genuinely deep down don't believe that he's wise. Maybe he's just an old dude a long time ago. Maybe they think he has nothing to say to us. Maybe the people are scared to read the Bible. Maybe people don't know where to start. May, I mean, I don't know. Maybe people are just ignorant that there's wisdom to be found in what Jesus taught. Maybe most people think... The gospel really is just about believing some facts about death and resurrection, and then you're done the rest of your life. I don't know. What I do know is that the average Christian I've ever met in my entire life seems never to actually figure out what Jesus said about life, how to treat people, how to treat God, how to react to God and respond to him. How do I work on not being bitter? How do I work on not worrying? How do I work on stress? What do I do with on and on and on and on it goes? And then, of course, make decisions in life even if he doesn't have an exact explicit teaching about it, make decisions in life based on something he did teach about other things. Uh, I, I don't mean that to be just a you know, party poop or discouragement, but, but as a form of encouragement, do you really think Jesus was the wisest person who ever lived? You know, it's funny in movies and TVs and whatever, it's real popular to talk about the Buddha or Siddhartha Gautama the Buddha or the Dalai Lama. That's real popular, the Dalai Lama. And you'll see quotes and memes on Facebook, Instagram, whatever. And of course, the assumption always is these little nuggets given to others and others will give to you or whatever, some nugget or whatever. And people like, 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 heart, heart, heart. Ooh, that's, that's good stuff. You don't see that about Jesus. You don't see memes about Jesus giving wise anecdotes for life. You don't see memes hardly ever that say, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow has enough worry of his own and on and on and on. You don't, what kind of, what does worry add to one cubic of your life? How many times do I forgive? Seven, three times, seven times? Nope, seven times. You just don't see it. And that's because most people, including Christians, don't think Jesus is that wise. And it's fascinating to me that the earliest Christians vociferously disagreed with that. The idea that God reveals wisdom in Jesus, in him, he's like a walking wisdom person is throughout the New Testament. Paul talks about it often. And one of the places he talks about it, and he does several places, one of the places he talks about it the most is the 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, uh, uh, one, chapter 1 and chapter 2. And he talks about how the idea of the that Jesus uh, died for us and rose to death, death basically the gospel message itself, it's foolish because that foolish, it looks, sounds foolishness to them. But in fact, for those who know it is true, it is wisdom. It is wisdom. He says, for example, 
in 118, for the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Notice those who are on the inside, they realize it's the power of God. Verse uh, 21, I'm going to skip ahead. For since in the wisdom of God, the world by its wisdom did not know God, God was pleased to save those who believe by the foolishness of preaching. Uh, for Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks ask for wisdom, but we preach about a crucified Messiah, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, and he almost certainly means called in a sense of salvation, those people who are called to be his children, the Messiah is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Listen to that. Messiah is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Surely Paul doesn't think God is foolish or weak. It's hyperbole. That is, <laughs> even... The dumbest thing God could ever think of is wiser than the wisest thing a human can think of. That's the hyperbole. And he goes on for all about wisdom and so forth, and, and it's it's really, really good. And later on chapter 2, he says, uh, chapter 2, verse 6, he says, now we, now, we do speak wisdom among the mature, or the grown, but not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are perishing. Instead, we speak of the wisdom of God, hidden in a mystery that God determined before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood it. If they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And I, and I could spend a long time unpacking all that, but I don't want to right now. My point only here is that this fits Paul's uh, theme through m many of his New Testament, of his letters that he composed, that, that the gospel message of Jesus the Messiah, this Christ event, as being a mystery that was, you might say, hidden or hidden in a mystery. Mystery, that is to say, only God knew it. God knew, God the Father knew that God the Son would come down, take the form of a human uh, ministry, talk about the kingdom of God, die for our sins, raise new life, ascend to the heavens of the right hand of God, like Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Paul would say, God the Father knew all that was going to happen, he, exactly, but he didn't tell people. The only time he told people is when it started happening, when Jesus came on earth and he revealed that wisdom. And now that revealed mystery is now been made, uh, it's been manifest, manifest to those who preach the gospel. And that's the point. It was hidden in a mystery, but now it's uh, way before, he said, determined before the ages of our glory, meaning before the earth was formed, God the Father knew that this was going to happen. And uh, God has revealed these, and he says in verse 10, God has revealed these to us by the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Now, what's interesting with the deep things of God is, couldn't be more vague, and that's frustrating to me. But it probably is the idea that whatever God thinks in God's heart and God's mind, that he knows those things, inside of those things. And so the spirit searches, God. it's like saying God's own spirit knows what God is thinking and feeling. Verse 11, for who among men knows the thing of a man except the man's spirit within him? So too, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. The point is, the only one who really knows, the who really, really knows, what uh, God's thinking is this is God's own spirit because God's own spirit is the, just like a human being. You don't really know what I'm thinking. I know what I'm really thinking. So the point is for you to really know what I'm thinking about something, I've got to tell you, I've got to tell you, I've got to reveal it. And that seems to be Paul's point here is that if you really want to know what God, the father's thinking, the spirit has to reveal him, Re reveal what God is thinking. And that's what he says in verse 12. Now we have not received the spirit of the world or this mindset attitude of the world, but the spirit who is from God so that we may know the things that are freely given to us by God. So the spirit who was from God, that is God gives us the Holy Spirit. And this goes back to what I said earlier in the podcast that one idea is that God's wisdom is given through his spirit, as we see in the Gospel of John and some other places. Verse 13, and we speak about these things, these these things, he certainly almost means, he means the things God planned beforehand, that is the gospel. I would say that's the gospel. We speak about these things, not with the words taught us by human wisdom, because why is that? Because that means they could just determine what God's plan is going to be from talking to mere mortals. No, no, no. God's will isn't like that. God's will has to be revealed in wisdom. Okay. He says, we speak about these things, not with the words taught us by human wisdom, but with those taught by the spirit explaining, you might say spiritual things to spiritual people. It means things of the spirit to people who are of the spirit. The unbeliever, or you might you really, okay, well, you can say unbeliever. It means the natural person in Greek. The natural person doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. 
He cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned or are discerned in the spirit. The one who is spiritual, the one that has the spirit, discerns these things, all things, yet he himself is understood by no one. Uh, for who has known the mind of the Lord so as to advise him? He's quoting, of course, from Isaiah forty thirteen. But we have the mind of Christ. And so this passage, though it's often used by very typically, standardly used by Christians to say, no one can understand anything of Christianity unless God reveals it. I don't find that persuasive. I don't think this means anything involving Christianity a pagan can't understand as God gives you enlightenment. That's the standard interpretation. I, I, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm dead wrong. I don't think that's the best way to understand that. I think really saying is it, it only <laughs> the things that God reveals in the spirit are only known by people who have the spirit of God. The things that God reveals via his spirit are only known by those who have the spirit of God. That's it. That's it. So that's it. But there are different ways to receive wisdom. And like I said earlier, one idea is to go through the law itself or the instruction of Jesus or some say the Torah. In Christianity, and even today, if I said, how would you learn wisdom? What if I'm a pagan? Well, you can learn how to order life well if you thoroughly study the Gospels. And you say, for example, how do I, how will I know how to deal with resentment? Well, I need to forgive people. Well, if I go back and read, read Matthew 7 and talk about uh, judgment and then, or Matthew 5 through 7. And I, let's just say the whole Sermon on the Mount. I'll keep this real general. And I, I apply the Sermon on the Mount of my life. You are going to be more wise and you will be more wise according to the teaching instruction of Jesus. Does that mean a non-Christian cannot simp can never simply understand anything in Matthew 5 through 7? I mean, I find that to be well, just demonstrably false. Pagans can read things, whether it be in English, Greek, whatever. They learn the language and learn to read it. But of course, does it mean that they understand everything God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit wants? No, I don't, that means I think they can't understand everything. There are certain things only people who have the Holy Spirit of God to say, something in me tells me this is what the Spirit is saying. Pagans don't understand that because they can't have an experience that because they don't have the Holy Spirit inside them. And I think that's Paul's point to the Corinthians. Paul's point to the Corinthians is, I think, even bigger, which is to say he's going to set up his argument because there are people in Corinth who are saying Paul doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. And uh, he just doing this because he's he didn't have the right education. Well, he's, he's critiqued him on multiple levels. But Paul says, no, 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 no. no yep, yeah, we're not as educated as all the educated people you are talking about it. But we don't care about our education. What we're caring about is receiving the Spirit of God who gives us wisdom to teach you Corinthians. So... Don't listen to those punks. That's a paraphrase. What do we do with wisdom? What do you do with it? Where do you go for it? Where do you seek it out? These are very good, fair questions. Like I told my daughter. Right? God wants us to live a life of wisdom. He wants us to live life order the way he wants us to live it. And if we're real honest about that, I would dare say that if you're, if you're like me, our gut reaction isn't very often to go to what Jesus said. Or the early church said, or even in the Old Testament, and said, say, how am I supposed to live my life? Well, that's a challenge for us today. Uh, I would encourage you, like myself, not to think that knowledge is synonymous with wisdom. Not to seek every single pagan thing we can to seek that. That's how we should order life. But instead say, what might a Christian say about this? What might Jesus say about these things? And really do some research. A Google search probably isn't that much research. Ask wise Christian teachers. Ask theologians, philosophers, and so any wise Christian friends. But again, you want to make sure it is wise because it comes from the teaching of the biblical text itself, uh, not just because they just are wise about how to fix a carburetor. <laughs> they want to be wise on the things of God, as it were, and have the spirit of God. So hope that works. Hope that helps. God bless you. Well, the conversation isn't finished. You can always reach out to me on social media. Are you on Facebook? I am too. At Glimpse of the Kingdom. Glimpse of the Kingdom on Facebook. Be sure to like it and you can see updates there. Also, if you're on Twitter, check me out at at Dr. D. Pendergrass. At Dr. D. Pendergrass. Or at Glimpse the King. At Glimpse the King. And I try my best to respond to comments and questions on there as quickly as I can. If you want more, there are many more resources on the podcast and my blog. Go to my website, davidpendergrass.com, davidpendergrass.com, and you can see a full list of the podcast, and my blog is available for free. 
Are you active in a church right now? I'd be happy to come out to your church and do all kinds of classes and workshops there. Check out davidpendergrass.com, davidpendergrass.com for more information. And may God in his great grace give you even just a glimpse of his kingdom this week. See you next time.